probably will continue to persist in the environment. Uh, so like spiders, ticks have eight legs. Um, they don't have any antenna and they have a flat, hard body. Um, so they have three basic parts. Um, they have the mouth parts there on the top. Um, the shield, which is this like uh, dark brown part, and then the abdomen, which is the rest of the body, which is where the blood and the pathogens are. So you can tell um, the males and females apart based on the size of that shield, which let me see if I can use my little laser pointer. Which, so this is the, the little shield part. So you can see with the males, um, it covers their entire abdomen, and then with the females, um, it, is, it covers just about half of it. Um, and that's because the females, uh, they really can engorge um, and that the shield provides, uh, for the males, they're not able to get bigger if, because they have that hard shield. Um, and they can get up to 10 times the size of their body, which is crazy to me. Even when they, when they take in fluid, they can go up to 10 times. Yes, yep, they can, yeah, when they are engorged. The males are a little bit smaller than females, and that shield, like I said, extends to the entire kind of size of their body. So that's one way that you can tell them apart if you're interested in doing that. So as I said before, when they're feeding on uh, blood from either a person or an animal, they can get up to 10 times the size. Um, but that shield that we were talking about, that stays the same size. Um, and so that's one way, we'll talk about this in a minute, how you can actually tell what type of tick it is. Um, because this body just looks so, makes it look so different once it's been feeding on a host. So ticks need to feed for up to 10 days, depending on the stage of life that they're in. Um, and so this means that they have a really specialized mouth to stay attached to a host. Um, so they have this, it's called a, a hypostome, this kind of barbed like mouth, um, so they can grab onto either an animal or a person and stay attached for up to 10 days. Um, so the only part that actually goes into the skin is this barbed hypostome. The rest of the tick actually stays outside of the body. Um, kind of a scary picture, uh, but that's real close. Um, and so when ticks are feeding on a person or an animal, they actually have a couple chemicals in their saliva that they um, pass to the host. Um, one is an anesthetic that makes it so that you actually don't feel the bite, um, and the other is an anticoagulant that keeps the blood from clotting. So ticks cannot jump or fly. They can? They cannot. That's a myth. Yes, yep. So they wait to ambush a host on grasses, shrubs, fence posts, and in order to actually find a host, um, they do something called questing, and so they wave their front legs in the air to sense heat, moisture, movement, and carbon, carbon dioxide that's breathe, breathed out by humans and animals. And then once a host is near, they'll grab onto the clothing or fur um, as you walk by and kind of walk up until they find a part on your body that they can bite and feed. Um, so they, they do not, uh, they can't jump onto you, they have to come up from the ground. Excuse me. Yeah. So, if you're out walking, they come up your, they're from, they can't come off of the trees or the, or the, or the, um, so in branches the, or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. So in theory, because ticks can attach to birds, um, they'll feed off of birds, yeah. they, in theory, could fall from a bird, but once they've um, had a blood meal and get engorged, they're not looking for another blood meal at that time. Um, so they really, the way that they'll find a person is by coming up from the ground. Um, yeah, so they're not, they don't fly. Um, they generally are not found in, in trees. They really like to hang out underneath leaves on the ground. Which so is, so yeah. if, a, if a tick gets on a bird mm -hmm. and stays for 10 days, mm -hmm. it, may, it may actually be flying around on that bird. It could be, yep. And then if the bird is in a tree, yep. and 10 days are up, the, the tick 
I'm lucid and may yep. fall to the ground or may, may stay in the tree. Yeah, and but after they've had that blood meal, they're not ready yet for another one. Um, they actually go and molt in the forest and be, move to the next life stage. So a tick, um, they're alive for about two to three years, and they only take three blood meals during their entire life course. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but I found that when I learned that very interesting that they don't just, you know, bite one person, get their meal, go to the next person. So it's just three times in their entire two-year uh, life cycle. Um, in Maine, we have about 14 species of ticks. Only two of them regularly bite people and um, are ones that we kind of think of most often. So people and pets in Maine most often encounter uh, deer ticks, which is this one here on the left. Um, and then American dog ticks, which is this one here on the right. Um, we also do have woodchuck ticks here in Maine, which um, mostly kind of stick around uh, burrows in the nests of woodchucks um, and other small mammalian hosts. They can bite people and animal, domestic animals if they have the chance, but they're not as often out and about like the other ticks. So all three of these ticks are considered endemic in Maine, which means that they have thriving populations and we expect to see them. So the two ticks on this slide are not considered endemic in Maine, um, meaning that they don't have thriving populations. Um, they, they do exist in the US and could become endemic here in Maine, um, but there, there are ticks that we're concerned about in general in the US. Um, so on the left is the Lone Star tick, which is an aggressive tick. They, they uh, are very successful at finding people to bite. Um, and we, we do see them quite a bit in Massachusetts. We occasionally have these submitted here in Maine for testing. Um, and so they, they have been, there have been sporadic ticks, but we, don't, we haven't yet identified a thriving population. And they're often associated with travel. What's the criterion for becoming a thriving population? That's a good question. Um, I think there's probably some number that the tick lab has, um, and I'm not, I don't have that uh, at this time. Uh, but the, so the Lone Star tick, one of the, um, there's a couple pathogens that we are kind of concerned about that it can transmit. One is called ehrlichiosis. And then there's also um, alpha gal allergy, which if you know anything about it is a red meat allergy, which can be caused by a tick bite, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And then on the right, we have the Asian longhorn tick, which recently invaded the U.S. It didn't used to be found in the U.S. at all. Um, so as of 2017, it is now here. Um, it's been found in 18 states, um, as far north as New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, but we haven't found them here in Maine yet. Um, in other countries, they spread pathogens and cause disease, but we haven't determined that they've done that here yet. So we don't know if they cause any disease here in the U.S., but research on that is ongoing. Uh, so we'll talk about the life stages and this, this well, you know, this kind of gets a little bit like science-y and biology-y. Um, I think it's helpful to understand when you could get bit and how often ticks actually bite. So all ticks have four life stages. They start as an egg, they develop into a larvae, which are baby ticks, and then turn into nymphs, which are teenage, and then adult ticks. Um, nymphs and adults all have eight legs but the larvae actually only have six legs. Uh, the larvae or the babies are about the size of a period in a 12 point font. So they're very tiny. Um, nymphs are about the size of a poppy seed and adults are about the size of a sesame seed. So deer ticks um, are known as three host ticks, which mean that they only feed on three hosts during their entire life cycle, which lasts around two years. So in the summer, the eggs hatch into larvae, and then they look for a small animal to bite and feed on, like a mouse. Once they feed for two or three days, they drop into the forest floor, and they stay there for the winter and fall um, while they molt or grow into nymphs. So during that period, they're not seeking out other people or animals uh, to, to feed on. They're kind of hunkering down and being protected while they grow. And then the nymphs, which are kind of the teenagers, come out during the next spring and look for a small or medium-sized mammal to feed on, like chipmunks, raccoons. They feed on them for about three to five days, and then again, drop up, off onto the forest floor, stay there. 
And then over the summer, they molt into adults. So kind of between that stage, they're again not looking for another meal until they've turned into an adult. Then the adults come out during the fall and look for a large size mammal, like a white-tailed deer, a dog, or human. And the, the adults will actually mate on the host. So that's kind of why we think of deers as being a problem with deer ticks. Um, the, the ticks find the deer and mate on the deer. They feed for eight to 10 days as well, drop off onto the forest floor, and then the females lay eggs, and then they die. Um, so if the adults don't find a mammal to bite on during the fall, they'll hunker down for the winter, stay protected, and then come out when the temperature is right to find um, a someone to feed on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what stage are they at now? Yeah. Because we went mm -hmm. walking I think two weeks ago and between my girlfriend and I we got three ticks. Mm -hmm. So were yep. those adult ticks that were on us trying to bite us or what? Yeah, so a little hard to tell without seeing them, but kind of based on what we know and knowing what type of ticks they are, yeah. if they were deer ticks, they could be nymphs or they could be adults. So this, right now we're really in nymphal season, which is um, kind of that teenage season. We're often seeing those smaller poppy, si poppy seed sized ticks. But we do also see um, adult ticks at this time if they're not, um, if they haven't uh, previously found a host. So it could be either, but this is really the time that we see a lot of nymphal ticks. So the nymph, are those, do they bite you and yeah. causes yeah. problems? Yeah. So we'll get into that a little bit more too. Yeah. So what preys on the ticks? What, like what eats them? Yeah. Um, there, are, there are a number of different animals. Um, so possums, um, there are chickens and different um, like poultry, um, other animals as well. But those are on the top of my head, those are the ones that we know um, do a pretty good job of so eating you ticks. you walk with a chicken on a leash, would that protect you? <laughs> I wouldn't say that it would protect you. <laughs> no, it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use. I, I personally wouldn't use that as my protection, but they are helpful in uh, in eating ticks. Yeah, that's so a good question. So if a tick does, you say it has a two-year. If for some reason the mm -hmm. tick doesn't find a host, mm -hmm. it just dies. So yeah. So they, for some life stages, they'll go into the forest and hunker down and then come back out later. But after a period of time, if they can't find a host, they do die. So just one mm -hmm. so I don't remember I mean I, I obviously we, there were ticks in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s what happened to make them yeah so fearsome yeah that's a really great question um, we'll kind of talk about what conditions they thrive in in a little bit but um, a lot of it has to do with uh, the way the climate has changed um, we have warmer weather um, which really contributes to ticks being alive or, or being allowed to be alive. Um, so were they always a problem? It's just now they live longer or they're spread more? So I'm not sure, but the fact that we're seeing them um, kind of this far north in areas that used to be colder longer, right. um, that's kind of the thinking. But I mean, we think back to the, like the 80s is really when we found out about Lyme um, and I'm not sure if, if we didn't have a name for it before or if that was truly when it was um, so kind so of... So it may have been just as, ticks may have been just as dangerous in but, the 50s. But we just didn't know or care as much, yeah, it's possible. But, so people were, the infection rates or whatever, they just yeah. didn't know what it was or... Totally possible. A lot of the tests that we use are kind of sophisticated. Um, and as we'll find out in a little bit, some of the pathogen or some of the diseases that they cause are quite hard to find. Um, so I don't have a great answer for if it was happening back then and we don't know, but there there are definitely reasons that we're seeing more of them. Right, so yeah. I was wondering if it, yeah. be, they became more Yeah, dangerous. that's a good question. I'll have to look into that. I'm, I'm not totally sure, yeah. Um, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about is deer ticks because as we'll find out later, those are the ticks that we're most concerned about here in Maine. Um, so deer ticks, prefer to live in protected environments like forests rather than in open areas. Um, so they're, they're a lot more common in deciduous forests, which you know means the trees lose their leaves every year, like oaks and maples. 
Um, and the ticks can often be found here in the leaf litter on the ground where they can really shelter from cold temperatures. They can also shelter from the sun and the, and the wind um, because ticks can dry out if it's too dry or too hot for them. Um, they can also be found in bushes and shrubs where there's not only shelter, but there's food like mice, deer, and other small mammals and birds. Um, and again, really we're thinking wooded areas because if they're out in kind of a dry, open area, they'll dry out themselves. So this sort of place, we would not expect to find deer ticks. Dog ticks can thrive in this environment, but we, there are no, we're not as worried about dog ticks because they don't cause disease here in Maine, thankfully. So, so ticks will travel on a host, mm -hmm. but if I'm a tick and I somehow find myself in the middle of the field, am I gonna start walking to the forest? Um, yes, if you can make it, yes, yeah. So I'll, I'll literally walk along mm -hmm. to hit that roof of the forest? Yeah. Mm. Um, you might find a host before then if you're at that life stage. You might die. Um, that you do not want to be here if you're a deer tick. So this kind of goes back to seasonality like we were talking about. So deer ticks peak at different times during the year. So we tend to see the largest activity of adult deer ticks here in the fall um, from September through November, and then another smaller peak in the spring, which, and that's because if they didn't find um, a host in the fall, they come back out in the spring. And then we see peak nymphal activity in June and July, which is where we are right now. And then larvae, which are the babies, are most active in the mid to late summer. And then the dog ticks are active from spring through summer with a peak in the spring. I know I found a lot of dog ticks this spring. So a quick review, um, different types of ticks here in Maine and they live in different habitats. So deer ticks, the woodland edges, in the forests, um, the dog ticks, they're good in those open fields and lawns as well as forests. And the woodchuck ticks more in the dens where their hosts are. Um, they can, the deer ticks can be active anytime the temperature is above freezing. So even in the winter, if it's above freezing, they can be active. Um, dog ticks April through August, woodchuck ticks in the summer. And then again, we just talked about the peaks. So early spring for the deer ticks and then another peak late in the, in the fall. So do humans only have to be concerned about the deer ticks or also the dog ticks? We'll get to that. So here in Maine, mostly just the deer, really only the deer tick, but there are other places that you would be concerned about the dog tick. Here in Maine, though, we're just concerned about the deer tick and some other ticks, but we'll get to all of that. All right, so um, the UMaine Cooperative Extension has a tick lab, and they do a lot of fantastic tick surveillance. Um, and so here we can see a map of all of the submitted deer ticks in 2021. Um, and it, each dot represents one tick. And so you can see, this is I think pretty much where we are right now, a handful of ticks, but looking at the coast, um, they are just um, you know full of ticks. But what I want you to, to notice is that deer ticks have been found in every county in Maine. Um, and we first found them in 1980s along the coast, but now they're, they are everywhere. The highest population though, of course, is this area. So do you think it's because they, hunting is very, very less um, in, in the coastal regions, so they have a larger deer population? Like I know MDI is huge, they, yeah. have, they don't, they can't hunt on mm -hmm. And so they have just got that problem. Yeah, that is a really great observation. Um, we'll talk about some of those hypotheses in a minute, but um, deer population per square mile is definitely a huge factor. Does that, does that though, does that map take into account population of those areas or no? So this is just the the actual ticks. The, the like each one is one tick. So it has nothing to do with population density. Um, and so of course, where there are more people, yeah. there are more people who can submit ticks. Um, and so where there the are 
That's yep. the correlation, isn't it? The more people, the more tick report, hence more dots. There yep. could be just as many ticks as this category with eight new people here. Yep. Um, so there are things that we can do to correct for that. Um, Excuse me? Yeah. It, what happens if you don't, if you get bit by a tick and you don't report it? Because I know it costs money to send in your tick to find out what it is. Yeah, we'll get to that. So this is just one way that we surveil ticks. Um, so there are tick dragging programs where um, research, research, researchers go out and they actually collect ticks. Um, so we, we know that this does not mean yeah. these are all of the ticks. This is um, a representation of, of what some of the data that we have. Um, really just to represent that we have ticks in all of Maine. But uh, those are really good observations and you guys should be epidemiologists because those are things that we think about. So to kind of answer the questions about why, you know, this is happening and why in certain parts, um, there's a number of different things that we think about that influence um, the tick populations both here in Maine and around the world. So precipitation, this link isn't super clear as it is with um, other pests like mosquitoes, but we, we think that it influences humidity, which is one of the really big factors um, with ticks. So ticks require a certain level of relative humidity in order to survive. If it's too dry, thinking about like the drought in summer 2020, um, they, they need to find somewhere that they can shelter from that dry temperatures, like that, the, the leaves on the forest floor. Um, and they can't be out looking for hosts because they'll dry out and die. Um, this differs a little bit by tick species, but you know, particularly with the deer ticks. And then temperature. So degree days are essentially the number of warm days above a certain temperature in a year. So ticks require a certain number of degree days during their life cycle in order to complete their life cycle. Um, and so as we're getting warmer and warmer, ticks have more degree days, meaning that there's more parts of Maine that they can complete their life cycle in. And we'll look at some maps of that in a second. Um, host populations, so going back to your mention of um, deer, so in order for the tick-borne diseases to actually occur, we need to have suitable reservoir hosts, um, or hosts that al actually allow that pathogen to survive and spread. In particular, uh, the deer ticks really thrive in habitats with white-footed mice and white-tailed deer. Um, and one thing that we think influences the tick population is when deer density is around five deer per square mile. Currently in Maine, we range from five to 15 deer per square mile. So that's lots of deer. <coughs> and I think um, I, I saw a paper about, I think it was um, maybe Monhegan Island, they like, didn't they like cull the deer a, oh, yeah. a while ago to kind of take care of this well, or yeah, try to? Just yeah. Okay. Right. And yeah. And the the reason deer are so important for deer ticks is um, they like to mate on deer ticks. So they go there, they find their mate, and then they lay two to five thousand eggs, which is crazy. After after the after they get off the deer. Yeah, they mate on the deer and then they get they off. They lay the eggs. Yeah, them. yeah, but they yet yeah, they mate on the deer. Um, and then habitat availability. So different, like we were talking about, the different habitats that they're able to survive and thrive in. Um, we have a lot of trees here in Maine, and so that kind of influences that as well. So talking about temperature, we're I, I mentioned um, degree days. So deer ticks require 1,240 days during their life cycle above 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So their two-year life cycle, two to three-year life cycle. Um, so during these maps, um, you can see this like brown area that's kind of moved up. So these are areas that have the appropriate amount of degree days for ticks to sur survive. So you can see here in the 80s, um, this brown area was really just down here, and then this blue area is specifically areas that ticks cannot survive. So in, from 80 to 89, a lot of Maine had areas that ticks could not survive. 
2010 to 2018, you can see this brown kind of moving up. And then they've done some modeling and predictive calculations that are above my head um, to try to see what they think is going to happen in the future. And you can see this brown is really invading, and there's few parts that have that blue where ticks cannot survive. So what that means is that we're concerned that by 2049, ticks will be able to thrive more in Maine um, relative to right now, which is uh, not great. So anyone can get a tick-borne disease. We're going to move into the d disease part. Um, based on the data that we have here in Maine and in the rest of the U.S., we find that people who are at most risk are people who are 5 to 14 years old, people who are over the age of 65, and people who spend a lot of time outdoors. And we're not sure if there's, you know, some biological reason for kind of these age groups or if it just has to do with um, being outside more. Maybe these are age groups that spend more time outside. Um, I don't have that answer, but you said anybody. Children, you said children 5 to 14, so if you took a baby and let the baby crawl around the center of five, then it's going to get it. Oh, yeah. So it's yep. just Any, risk. So anybody can Any. get it. But these are, these are just the groups. When we look at the data and we see who has the highest amount of tick-borne diseases, tends to be these age groups. Um, but anybody can get a tick-borne disease, for sure. And so, yes, if you had a baby crawling around, you would uh, expect that a tick could attach to them if they were in a tick, tick area. So kind of getting into the tick-borne diseases, we think of three categories. We have common tick-borne diseases, we have rare tick-borne diseases in Maine, and then we have potential and emerging threats. Um, so with the common ones, we have Lyme, which I'm sure you've heard of, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. In the rare category in Maine, we have hard tick relapsing fever and Powassan encephalitis, uh, which are both caused by pathogens that are found on ticks in Maine, but we don't see a lot of cases of either of those diseases each year. And then ehrlichiosis, um, which is caused by a pathogen that we uh, is not known to be on ticks in Maine, but we see cases that are associated with people traveling into Maine. So they had gotten it somewhere else and then come here. And then in the potential threat, um, we have spotted fever, rickettsiosis, tularemia, and Heartland virus. These are pathogens that we have not found in ticks in Maine, but it's possible that they could move here. Um, so each species that we've talked about can carry different pathogens, and I think this is really important. Um, I know I find a lot of dog ticks in my yard, um, and as we'll see in a moment, um, not something to be super concerned about at this time. Um, so yeah, so back to, so deer ticks can cause Lyme, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, hard tick, hard tick relapsing fever, and Powassan. Um, dog ticks in other places have been known to cause spotted fever, rickettsiosis, and tularemia. Um, we've sampled many, many dog ticks over the years in Maine, and we have never found those pathogens, which is very positive. We'll continue testing. And then woodchuck ticks can also cause Powassan. And then Lone Star, Ehrlichiosis, Tularemia, and Heartland virus. And all of these diseases with the asterisk are not found in ticks in Maine. Um, so what we're really kind of uh, most concerned about at this time are these diseases with the deer ticks and then the woodchuck ticks with Powassan. I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, different diseases that can be caused by ticks. And we'll start with Lyme. Um, so Lyme is caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi, which is this lovely little picture here. Um, so deer ticks pick up the bacteria by biting and feeding on mice, birds, and other small mammals who are infected with that bacteria. Not all animals and not all deer ticks are infected with that bacteria, and it's impossible to tell by looking at a tick if it's infected. Once a deer tick gets the bacteria, it's infected for the rest of its life, um, and people and pets can get sick with Lyme disease if they're bitten by a deer tick that carries that bacteria. So where do they pick up the bacteria? Yeah, so they, the, deer, the tick picks it up from a 
like a mouse, a bird, something else that has a bac that bacteria. And I'm actually not sure where those animals get it from. I'm not sure if when like a mouse, um, like I don't know if they get the, it from each other or whatnot, but when uh, the tick takes a blood meal from one of those animals, then it infects them and then they're infected forever. As we talked about though, um, they only take three blood meals. So they only really have three chances to get infected. Um, and so not every tick bite means that you're gonna get Lyme disease. So good thing to be very aware of. So the bacteria lives in their abdomen, so kind of this part down here. And so once one of these ticks bites you, it can take 24 to 48 hours of it being attached for the bacteria to replicate in its abdomen and then move from the abdomen into the salivary glands and then into a person. So 24 to 48 hours of having a tick on you before you're infected with Lyme. So any, any time up to the 24 hours if you remove the tick, you're now safe? No. We'll get, we'll get to that in a little I assume bit. somewhere in this speech you'll have some happy news for us. I, yes, we'll get to the, the prevention there, at there, the end. There will be happy news. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, doesn't make me a very popular well, guest can, by giving this yeah, presentation. So far, it's like a, at least it's after lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Lyme, Lyme disease, um, typically symptoms occur in the first month after a bite. Um, so early symptoms include fever and chills, fatigue, muscle and joint soreness, and in many cases a bullseye rash. And aside from the bullseye rash, those are very general symptoms, um, like it you know, feels like the flu. Um, so it's really important to kind of assess if you've had tick bites because this can be hard to differentiate from other illnesses. Um, the bullseye rash is, um, we call it erythema migrans, but also bullseye rash. So it's a slowly expanding, usually non-itchy rash <coughs> that looks like a bullseye on some people. Um, it can appear anywhere on the body, not just where the tick has um, bit. So it's really important to kind of look all over your body if you're around ticks um, for something like this. Um, and I just want to point out that they look different on different people, but the important thing is that they start as one size and they grow. Sometimes they really look like a target, and sometimes they, they just look a little more like these ones are kind of like these there's like three circles, but they got bigger on this person. This one's a little bit uh, like purple, and this was behind the knee. But here, this is actually just irritation from a tick bite. And on this person, the redness did not grow. And so um, this actually was not Lyme disease in that person. So if you ever find a tick on you and see some redness, I always think it's a good idea to kind of draw around that, like where that redness is occurring. And if you notice it expand out, that's when it's a good time to call your doctor. Um, if you don't catch and treat Lyme right away, um, it can progress to uh, late symptoms of Lyme weeks or years later. And so this can include some arthritis, um, neurologic symptoms, heart problems. Treatment can be really effective if you start it right away. So do talk to your healthcare provider if you, know, you get a tick bite and are concerned about that. Um, so this is a kind of the distribution of Lyme in the U.S. in 2020. Um, we can see all of this green here really represents um, individual cases. So we can see how, uh, you know, widely distributed in the Northeast it is, and then also in the upper Midwest. We can see the rates here of Lyme disease per 100,000 by county. Um, so the lighter colors, so the yellow represents less cases and the dark red represents more cases. So we can see over time, um, we're seeing more cases throughout the state. I do wanna note that, you know, I know Piscataquis is um, popping up red here and <coughs> there definitely are more cases in 2022, but this is, you know, there's I think 17,000 people in the county and um, this is per 100,000 people. So you'd have to kind of divide this by five, essentially. So there's, you know, there are there are a growing amount of cases, but it's um, it is a little bit alarming when you see red on a map, and it doesn't mean that everybody 
see here has Lyme disease. But it's like it's like ten cases, basically. Yes. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Which is more than we had in twenty ten. Um, so it's still a, a growing problem. Um, so we've had uh, human cases of Lyme reported since the early nineties here in Maine. Um, so this here shows kind of the the trends over the past ten years. We see variation and. Of course, 2020 just changed a lot of disease reporting. People weren't going to the doctors. Doctors were not necessarily reporting. But the general trend is that we're seeing increases um, you know, throughout the years. Um, I find this really interesting. So this shows the, um, the onset of symptoms from confirmed Lyme disease cases um, over a year. And so we can see that there's these really obvious peaks in the summer season. So this means people started experiencing symptoms in the summer. And that corresponds with um, kind of the, the like tick activity that we were seeing before. So the nymph, the like nymph season is when people are experiencing their first symptoms of Lyme, potentially from getting bit by an adult tick or by a nymph, nymphal tick. The challenge with the, those nymphs is they're so small. They're like the size of a sesame seed. Um, so they can be, sorry, a poppy seed, which is even smaller. And so those can be really challenging to find on your body. Um, this just shows cases by age group. Um, and I'm not, we don't need to spend a lot of time looking at charts and graphs, but what we can see is that in all age groups, we're seeing increasing numbers of reported cases over time. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on, on this one either, but um, this is showing the different, um, the percent of our cases here in Maine that have different symptoms. So this red line is the percent of cases that had that, that bullseye rash. And what I want to kind of stand out to you is that only around 50% or less of our cases actually have that red rash. Um, and so we often think of that as like the way to know that you might have Lyme, but only about half of our cases here had that. And so that's what makes prevention so important, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Move on to anaplasmosis. Um, this is uh, caused by a bacteria that infects white blood cells, which are part of your immune system. Um, and it's spread through the bite, again, of deer ticks. Um, so again, with uh, anaplasmosis, we're thinking of symptoms like fever and chills, headache, muscle aches, nausea, abdominal pain. These are pretty general symptoms, again. And this can really range from um, pretty mild to quite severe. Um, and most people don't experience all of these symptoms at the same time. Um, in Maine, again, just like we saw with Lyme, um, we're seeing increases um, since 2013. We're also seeing a similar uh, distribution throughout the state. We'd expect Lyme and anaplasmosis to look kind of similar on charts and graphs because it's carried by the same tick, which is the deer tick. Babesiosis, um, another disease caused by deer ticks, and this is a parasite. Um, they infect your red blood cells. Um, they also, aside from ticks, can be caused by blood transfusions, and so the Red Cross actually screens for this in blood. Um, again, it has to stay attached for 36 to 48 hours to transmit to another person. Again, similar symptoms, fever and chills, headache, fatigue, and this can start weeks or months after a tick bite. Um, these maps and graphs should look similar to what we've seen before. Again, since we're talking about the same tick, we're seeing very similar trends. Um, it looks like here in Piscataquis, we didn't see any babesiosis cases, which is great, um, but we are kind of still seeing this trend upward throughout the state. Um, we have other tick-borne <laughs> diseases here, but in, in smaller amounts. Um, the theme that I want you to notice is that we're seeing very common symptoms for all of these tick-borne diseases. Fever and chills, headache, muscle and joint pain, fatigue. Um, so th those are things that should be on your mind if you spend a lot of time out in the woods um, to keep, keep an eye out for the, those symptoms so you can talk to your doctor if you think you might have um, a tick-borne disease. 
I just want to hit uh, quickly on Powassan. So you can see we don't have a lot of cases of Powassan. Um, just one, one or a couple every year since you know for the last few years. But this is a very serious virus. Um, it often does result in death. Um, and unlike the other diseases that we talked about, it can take just about 15 minutes for the, of the tick being on you to transmit it. Um, and it is a virus, it's not a bacteria, which means that we don't have a medication that can treat this. Um, the good news is that it's very rare in Maine, um, and a lot of people actually have no symptoms. Um, but we, like I said, we do find we have had a number of cases die of this. And so this makes prevention, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, even more important because 15 minutes is not a very long time for a tick to be on you. Ehrlichiosis, this is another, um, you know, less common tick-borne disease here in Maine. Um, again, those nonspecific symptoms that we already talked about. And we can skip spotted fever rickettsiosis. I'll touch really briefly on alpha-gal because it's pretty interesting. So this is um, a syndrome that is passed on by the lone star tick, which you can see this little yellow dot is what signifies this tick. Um, so this is actually an allergy that is passed on by a tick. Um, so they spread, they, when they infect you with their saliva, they pass on this, um, essentially like they give you this immune response to um, mammalian products, so meats, um, cow milk, um, and other products. This is, you know, we don't think that we have a thriving population of Lone Star ticks here in Maine, but this is definitely something that we're still very uh, aware of and thinking a lot about because um, alpha-gal is in a lot of things, a lot of foods, it's in some medical products, um, and we want people to be aware of this. So after someone has been in contact with a Lone Star tick and had this transmitted to them, um, some period of time later they might eat um, a mammalian product and then two to ten hours later start experiencing symptoms of a, a severe allergy which could include anaphylaxis. Um, so this is, is not something that's incredibly common um, in the U.S., but we are aware of it and um, it's something to know about when you're talking about tick-borne diseases. So now let's get to how you can avoid all of this. Um, there's a lot that we can do to prevent tick bites. Um, kind of the best way to go about this is preventing them all together. So we, we kind of have a couple buckets that we talk about. So um, the first is wearing protective clothing. So wearing long sleeves, um, tucking your socks into your pants. Because um, if we, we talked about ticks crawling up your body and so if you remove that opportunity for them to you know, get under your pants, you've kind of removed um, some mode of transmission. Wearing light colored pants also is helpful. These, you know, the, this color pants makes it really hard for me to actually see ticks or bugs on them, but if you're wearing like khaki or white, you can see that tick kind of stand out against it. Um, you can treat your clothing with uh, permethrin. So this is a product that you can, um, you can actually buy clothes that are already treated with this, or you can purchase it at like a sports, sporting goods store and um, you treat your clothes and it repels the ticks. So it stays on for a couple washes and then you can just reapply it in a little, like after you've washed your clothes. Um, it's a really fantastic product to put on all of your clothes that when you're going outside. And then also if you have pets that go outside, dogs and cats, talking to your vet about um, products that prevent them from getting ticks. There are certain like repellents that they can use um, because as we know, ticks can bring, or pets can bring the ticks inside um, and then you have ticks in your house, which is a not, not fun problem to have. And I'll take this moment to remind you that again, ticks can be out anytime that it's above 30 degrees. So these are strategies that you would want to use year round. Yeah. Okay, there's um, products you can buy like um, any of the bug sprays or yep. anything. They spray, uh, yep, the black and this. You don't have, oh, okay. You have, um, yeah, I don't see up there that you have one that's high and deep. Yeah, so, so 
there's a whole host of EPA approved repellents. So DEET is one of them. Um, permethrin, which we talked about before, is another one. Um, so we were the previous slide is kind of before you're actually doing something. But once you're going out, we would definitely recommend that you wear a repellent. Um, so yeah, DEET, permethrin, um, picardin. Um, also, like if you're in an environment like this, staying in the middle. Um, while ticks can kind of be in the, the leaves here, they can also really be on that, the, ed, the forest edges. So staying on groomed trails um, is really important. And also just checking for ticks if you're really out in the woods for a long period of time, um, seeing if you have any on yourself um, during, during your recreation. Um, so this is kind of the list of um, products. Um, so these, the EPA approved products are um, it means that like the, the active ingredient in the product um, has been tested. We know that it works to repel ticks um, and how long it, it works to actually, you know, prevent them. Um, we also know that these things are safe if they're used properly. I'll take a moment to point out that um, often you can buy tick repellents that are also insect repellents, but ticks are not insects. And so um, a lot of these, you know, work for both both things, but it's always important to kind of check the label and make sure that you can use it for both. Um, but yeah, DEET um, is, you know, a pretty common one. And then after, this is, um, you know, very important. So after you've spent time in, you know, high grass in a forested area, um, check for ticks. So ticks, um, they really like uh, certain parts of the body. So um, like protected areas, areas that might be dark, like if you have, um, like often we, we find them like in the hairline, sometimes in the ears, armpits, um, like or, or along your waistband. So after you come back inside, check your body, take a shower. That can both help to wash the ticks off and give you the opportunity to check out and make sure you don't have any. Um, also throw your clothes in the dryer for 10 or 15 minutes after you've been outside and then put them in the washer. Um, the dryer will kill the ticks and then you can wash your clothes as normal. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything here. And so while I talked about that one tick or that one disease that occurs in could occur in 15 minutes, the most common tick-borne tick diseases that we see in Maine take 24, 36, 48 hours and so if you make a habit of doing this and really checking to make sure that you don't have an attached tick, um, that can really go a long way in preventing these more common tick-borne diseases. What do you do if you find a tick? You wanna take it off. So some people have a tick spoon, which is, I'll show you a picture of in a second, but you can also just use um, your, your pointiest tweezers. Um, so if you use tweezers, you wanna grab the tick um, as close to your skin as possible and pull directly up. Sometimes the mouth parts might stay in your skin. That's fine. They won't transmit. They won't like continue tra to transmit anything. Um, don't use petroleum jelly. Don't use a hot match. Don't use nail polish or other products. Really just pull it out. So either with tweezers or a tick spoon, which you'll, you'll see a picture of. And then monitor yourself typically for a month for symptoms, um, fever, chills, those body aches. Again, most of these tick-borne diseases, you have to have the tick on you for quite a long period of time, um, but we do want you to, to monitor and see if you have any symptoms pop up. Uh, this is what a tick spoon looks like. You kind of just like scoop it up. Um, and then with tweezers, um, you just pull straight up, like I said, and they do a good job of showing you just want to grab it as close to uh, your body as possible. And this also, these instructions work for animals as well, if you find one on your dog or cat. What do you do with your tick? So we don't recommend throwing them away or flushing them down the toilet because they might crawl back out of either of those things. Um, so rubbing alcohol, um, if you put them in a little container with rubbing al alcohol, that'll kill them. Um, and also preserve them if you do want to have your tick tested. Um, if you don't have rubbing alcohol, find a sealed container to put it in. Because um, again, we, we were talking about ticks being alive during the dinosaurs, like when the dinosaurs were around. Like these are very hardy animals. 
Um, and so <laughs> you really have to be very intentional about disposing of them. So to monitor ticks in the state of Maine, UMaine um, does tick identification free of charge. So if you're a Maine resident, you can mail your ticks into them. There's an online form. I re recommend just Googling UMaine Tick Lab, kind of walks you through all the instructions. So they'll be able to say, this is a deer tick, this is a dog tick, this is a Lone Star tick for free. And then for um, $20, they'll test your tick for um, the different pathogens that we see here in Maine. So they would t test for like Lyme disease, tularemia. Um, I do want to note that th it's a really cool thing that we have that opportunity, but we don't recommend that you like get your tick tested and say, oh, it, it doesn't have anything, that means that I'm safe. Or I tested it, it says that it has Lyme disease, I have Lyme disease. You still really want to monitor yourself for symptoms and you can share that information with your doctor, but we really don't recommend that you kind of base your life around the results of these ticks. And then if you do start to feel sick, talk to your healthcare provider. Most of the diseases can be treated with antibiotics, except for Powassan. Um, supportive care also is you know, something that they can do in a hospital environment. Um, that. And then finally, there are ways that you can um, keep your yard safer. So if you're spending time at home in your yard, um, keep your, your lawn mowed. So having higher grass um, provides more cover for ticks to hang out. Um, keep leaves raked and get rid of those leaf piles. We talked about how ticks like to hang out kind of um, underneath leaves to stay in a cooler, more humid environment. Um, move wood piles away from the house. Um, in recreation areas, um, move bird feeders away because um, we know that ticks like to hang out on birds. Um, and then even creating a border around your house with crush, crushed stone or wood chips. Um, I, I haven't heard too much about how this this um, works in action, but I guess it can kind of help, like provide a barrier for ticks that you know they don't want to cross these stones, um, and they might dry up and die before actually getting to you. So that's kind of it. Um, I, I know you guys asked some questions along the way, but I'm happy to take any more questions that you guys might have. I know I just uh, word vomited a lot of tick information at you guys, so um, happy to try to answer any other questions you might have. So when, when you remove them, you don't mm -hmm. have to get them per, I always heard that if like the head's so attached or, or if you squeeze it, could like spit the stuff into you, is that not true? So, this is that's why we have a specific way we recommend you remove it so if you pull if you like really um like don't grab its abdomen mm -hmm. grab as close as you can to you and pull straight up yeah. um and then if it's mouth parts are still in you like that's that's okay um it's the abdomen is where the bacteria or the other pathogens live um and so you know that's not going to be inside your body if you've removed um So, also does like, can wrap, I've heard people like wrapping duct tape around their ankles, does that actually work or is there any science behind that or is it just like I, something that might work? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I actually have not heard of that. I, that you're, I mean, you're creating a barrier, so yeah. I can't see why that wouldn't work. It might be a little uncomfortable, but um, yeah. that's, yeah, that's definitely one way to do it. I've always heard like tuck your pants into your into boots your and socks. then wrap, yep. it, wrap the duct tape like backwards so okay. the sticky side's out. Oh, that's a really great idea. So then if yeah. the ticks crawl up, then they just stick directly to the duct tape. Yeah. But I've never actually done that and then seen, like you see pictures on the internet where there's 50 ticks stuck to it, but oh my gosh. that's probably fake. But I mean, there are some areas where there's certainly that many, <laughs> many ticks <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> that sort of makes me think of... Um, I've gotten the advice to use like a lint roller on my dog. Um, uh, haven't done it yet, but uh, no, it's not. It's not the garlic that you wear around your neck to prevent it. That's <laughs> vampires, right? Yeah. right? But actually, lemon eucalyptus is protective against ticks. So you wear it on your ankles, then? You yeah you you. It's one of the many tools that you can use. Maybe a um, mustard poultice around it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, people want to think you're right? That would though. Maybe Jane. <laughs> And um, I will note, so Maine, Maine CDC, um, this is our 
probably everyone else. This is we, our phone number. Um, this wasn't the good news. Why are we getting to the good news? Or are no. you still saving it? That's, that's, saving that's it. it. Yeah. That's it. No, I, I can't really speak to the vaccine, unfortunately. That's kind of a, a whole different uh, so ball think, game. But. Do you think Lyme, Lyme disease existed before 1970? We just didn't know what it was? That's a really good question. And I I could like speculate, but I, I don't think that I know enough to give you a good answer. <laughs> So I've heard, I've heard too that um, the tests have a lot of false positives and false negatives mm. for Lyme. Well, yeah, true. that's a really good point. So yeah. unlike other um, bacterial diseases, Lyme uh, doesn't stay in your blood for a long time. And so if you have a tick bite, if your t- the tick was on you for like 36 hours and you go to the doctor, um, they it's hard to do a test at that time that shows that you could have Lyme. So um, it's not in your blood anymore. No. Right. And there's, so what we, we typically use is um, an antibody test, um, but it takes a while for that to show up. And then the other challenge is that Lyme um, often cross reacts with other illnesses. And so kind of the sensitivity is, is not as high as we would like it to be. And so, um, Sometimes it could be positive, but it's really, you have another disease. And so this is why, like, knowing that you've had a tick bite is mm-hmm. a really helpful part of the clinical diagnosis. Yeah, I've, I have some friends that have Lyme, and they basically just said that their doctor gave them the test, but said that it wasn't mm. 100%. Yeah. And if yep. you have the symptoms and you know you had a tick, it was probably Lyme, and they just treat it as if it is. That, that, okay. that definitely happens. And they got okay? If, if you let it go longer, it yeah. can like relapse and it can have yep. more symptoms. So yeah. you might take some antibiotics and knock it down. And then a year later, you could have the same symptoms recur. And then you have to take some more antibiotics. Yeah. So it can kind of be on yeah. and a dormant. Is there a book or a resource that librarians have where you say, depressing topics to have lectures on? <laughs> and you got this one. And I was like, why did you pick this one? Like, why did I come? This is very, it's very informative. Yes, I was depressing. Uh. We're trying I know, to I'm you really fun at parties. From the rest of the <laughs> I want to get a chicken, though. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend a possum. That's the other one that can be helpful. But yeah, uh, if you were going to get a chicken anyways, it might be. No, but the possum would be a good idea because they're amusing animals. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, don't, they don't do well. Uh, and you get eggs from the chicken. And you get, well, that's true. Yeah. Then you have other diseases to worry about, so. No. Oh, is next week the Black Plague? Is that when you get that? <laughs> <sighs> well, I appreciate you guys coming and listening. I know it's yeah, not the the most fun and exciting topic, but thanks for asking questions and uh, very good. taking the time to listen. Yeah, very yeah. We're more enlightened now. So you want to talk good. about it again? You, you just grab a hold of it and lift it straight up. Yeah. Yep. With that tweezers or with your little, with your little Twe- tweezers. tweezers. So find your sh- your like pointiest tweezers. Um, and so let me go back to that picture. Um, pointiest tweezers. Yeah. So some people might have some duller tweezers. Um, if you have multiple pairs, get your like your sharpest ones. Um, and essentially, like you want to go as close to your skin as possible, and with like firm steady pressure just straight up pull it off so you're going to come at at it from the side not from the top correct yep because you could um potentially i don't know much about what would happen if you squeezed it and all the gunk fell out of his Mm -hmm. abdomen but that could happen Um, and then in theory since you have an opening on your skin i don't know if it could leak in but to avoid that yeah come in on the side like you said um, grab it from its head, pull straight up. If you still see its mouth in there, that's fine. It'll come out eventually. So when the tick bites you, are there little legs? Are there little legs up in the ground, and it's, it, is it like vertical? It's not horizontal. It'll it'll sit I, against I, your skin. So it's not yeah. the tick is standing on its head. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's not standing. Yeah, on its head. but once it gets engorged, um, I mean, we saw how kind of big and ugly they get when they're engorged. So it, it just might not look like that picture. Let's find an engorged tick. Yeah, far back, I guess. Like, is it like raisin-sized? Yes. Bigger? So 
There we go. Um, <laughs> or a baby over there. Um, so when I was a kid, yeah. they used to use matches. Yeah. So they does that like they used to put like a match down and then they would like come out and then they would like fall out or yeah. whatever. I think the concern is that that might actually harm you in another way. Sure. Um, well, that's what I mean, you yeah, burn. Yeah, but be. yeah, because they used to. I mean, I watched people yeah. do it all the time where they would like see a dick and they'd like light a match. Yeah. Blow it out and then like put the hot match on the yeah. tick and it would like. I would not recommend that. I've I've pulled um, many a tick off of other people yeah. um, and animals and have found just a good pair of tweezers and straight up to be quite effective, even on a squirmy little child. So you don't put lighter fluid on that, set fire to lighter fluid. Set up, yeah. Right. Don't set fire to them. I mean, unless it's off the ear, you can do it too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, getting back to the um, uh, burn. Just a little tidbit of information. You can actually, if you get burnt or touch something that's burned you, um, egg whites mm. are oh, the cure. It, it uh, takes the pain away and it helps with the healing. Cool. I didn't know that. Good to know. So when you go back to your office, you're going to say, boy, you were right about Dora Park's <laughs> Are you going to say that? Like, I found a place where I want to retire to. Yes. Yep. I mean, where else could I get tick cupcakes? Right. You should take you should take some back to this clinic. Well, no, I'll, I'll take one for the road. Like they're disappearing over here. Here's tick great. Stuff. What? Who's been eating them? What? Have you been giving those little children? children <laughs> You've been giving them to the children? Uh, giving them to the children. Um, we do have behind on the, the tick table or cupcake table. <laughs> oh, I should have brought some ticks with me. Um, we have them in like, you know, like dead ones that are preserved. Um, but there's a little tick identification card. I find it really, really helpful to understand the difference between a deer tick and a dog tick because I definitely find both in my yard and I find both on my dog. Um, and if I know this is a dog tick, I'm just going to take it off and can kind of have some peace of mind. Um, but kind of knowing how to different, dif differentiate, and let me see if I can find that picture. So you see on the deer ticks, um, or let's look at the dog tick, the, the shield has these white markings on it, um, whereas the deer tick is more solid color. And so I, I find that really helpful when I'm finding ticks um, out in the wild because deer tick, I think disease, and dog tick, I just think it's annoying. Does that mean that chicken doesn't have to worry about uh, a tick getting on its body? I don't know. I'm not sure. sure. But other, I mean, they, they definitely eat them. Eat them. No, but, but the chickens would eat them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm honestly not sure. Actually, I wish I knew more about kind of the whole... Guineas are better at getting ticks. They eat more ticks than chickens do. What does? Guineas, like the little... Oh, guinea fowl. Yeah, guinea fowl. yep, that's the, yeah. do you know the other one. Do you not yet, not yet. No, they're all on my command. So you should, you should start a service, though. Little chickens on the leash. So <laughs> I think, I think you should walk with a very now guinea. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the, uh, the approach of the reverse duct tape coupled with garlic, a ring of garlic. <laughs> That's my. While opinion. you're walking your possum down yeah. the street. While walking my possum. Yeah, yeah. My chicken, ah, my chicken on the left, my possum on the right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Who needs a vaccine? Indeed. <laughs> uh, but you don't know anything about the vaccine. I know that there there are some trials happening right now, and they yeah. they're working with um, migrant farm workers who are particularly affected. Um, but I, I really don't know much more than that. They there was a vaccine that was uh, I think it was in the early two thousands um, that was on the market. It was pulled for like. What, not a lot of demand, um, but I'm not well, sure. I can't believe that. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was like code for because there there weren't any um, like, as far as I know, there weren't uh, complications that came from it. There weren't adverse events. So uh, yeah, I just. I've yeah, always I heard know. that it wasn't commercially viable for the company doing it. Like they wouldn't be able to make enough profit with it. Yeah. So are you from away? Are you originally are you from Maine? So I'm uh, I'm from New Hampshire. Um, 
I that's where I grew up, and then I lived in Chicago for a number of years, and then came back. Where in New Hampshire did you grow up? Nashua. The coast. Not, not really. <laughs> no. It's, so did you um, see the old man in the mountain before it crashed? Yes. Yeah. You I remember where I was when I heard that it fell. This person sitting to my right, which would be like Jane. We finally we drove by it. We stopped, and I looked at it like that, and I said, "Well, that's pretty." This is before it fell down. That's pretty impressive. And Jane kept looking, and then she asked, "Where was it?" And I couldn't, I couldn't explain to her where it was, but she was the only one that looked at the old man and didn't see the old man in the mouth. I have a lot of pride for it, and when I try to describe it to people who are not from New Hampshire, they're like, "And why is it on your license plate?" <laughs> Why, is, why does everyone care? I, I thought it was it's just cool. cool. It's, yeah. it's well, you can't be. It'll never see a drive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for thank coming. Appreciate it. And this is the first place you ever went that had tick cupcakes. Th yeah. <laughs> <laughs>